Hey y'all, welcome to Geek Freaks. I am Frank, and today I'm joined by the wonderful Titus Walker of the Ultimate End Gamer League. How are you doing, Titus? I'm pretty good. How are you? Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. The UEL, can you kind of explain what that is for us? Sure. Uh, yeah, it's the short version is that it's the UFC of gaming. So it's combining all competitive genres of gaming, uh, fighting games, sports games, shooting games, racing games and strategy games, and then creating a single competition where your goal is to be the best gamer as a whole period. Uh, so you're going to compete in across all genres to see who's the better gamer as a whole. Why make it to where they're competing against all genres? Did you feel like that was a hole that was missing in a lot of other uh, avenues? Yeah, I think that um, trying to be inclusive of of uh, of every type of gamer was important to me. Um, I, I I'm the type of person I, I really enjoy playing lots of different games, and um, and you know we actually found in our research that uh, when we were creating it, the average gamer plays 24 games a year. So um, keeping it to just a single game felt like cutting somebody out. Yeah. Um, and I, I grew up in a big family and that was a big no, no. So, <laughs> um, so try to keep, you know, keep everybody included and make sure there was something for everybody was important to me. When your players are training for this, do you feel like there's a certain genre they have to train a little bit harder for? That's a great question. I, I honestly believe that they're all pretty equal. I think strategy games are normally tough for people that don't normally think in a, in, in a strategy way. So it's like the hardest uh, genre to learn if your brain doesn't operate that way because you really got to shift the way your mind thinks. Um, but shooting games are probably the most like difficult um, from a mechanical standpoint. Yeah. So I think between those two is is normally like where the competition lies. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Yeah, myself, I think I could handle the strategy stuff, but when I'm playing with like my nephew or whatever, those kids are so fast on that Fortnite, I can't yeah. pull the buildings fast enough. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, okay, so you founded this thing. What inspired you to to found uh, UE uh, UEL? Was it because you wanted to see a diversity in, in genres? Yeah. So when I when I got into it, I came from a real estate background. So mm -hmm. um, coming into gaming, I immediately noticed that um, the game, the, like every community, was kind of created based on a single game, um, and that always becomes an issue because if that game doesn't succeed or it does, and then you know fails later on you know, you end up in a situation where now you lose uh, your community because of it. And so what I tried to do is build something that I could keep ownership of and that I could keep the rights to. And so in order to do that, I had to have kind of this holistic gamer approach. Um, and the community seemed to really latch onto it and, and love it. And, you know, so we started to really build something and see something there. And, you know, the rest is, is kind of history. You started out with a family owned gaming lounge. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you expand beyond that into uh, uh, increasing your community size? Yeah. So when we started the gaming lounge, it was um, strictly business, like, you know, a certain amount of hours used that creates this much money and blah, blah, blah. Um, but coming from real estate, I always knew you have to you have to position yourself correctly and you always have to think about who your competition is. And the competition in this case was always, you know, their basement or their man cave or whatever. Yeah. Um, and I know I couldn't really compete with that with with that without creating something that really, really drew people in. And so I tried to create a competition that um, was fun. Uh, but th that also was just so, so different and so new and so entertaining, um, that they kind of felt like they had to leave that basement because they couldn't get that anywhere else. That's interesting. Yeah. So the UEL was kind of first, almost a way to push the gaming lounge and then it grew into its own beast. <laughs> yeah. 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 It really was. It was like to get people into the door and get them playing video games and paying hourly and, um, and, there, and very quickly, it kind of shifted and became the opposite direction where it was yeah. like, yeah, forget the gaming lounge. We're doing this UEL thing. <laughs> <laughs> it, it moves fast like that, especially in the gaming yeah. world. Yeah. Um, now, you try to foster uh, culture and collaboration. You guys got to check out the website. It'll be links in the description. Uh, how do you try to do that? What are some of the steps you take? Yeah, so we, we try and take a, an approach of like finding a game because it's truly like cool. It's truly yeah. interesting. Um, it's super fun, maybe has like a cult following, but maybe not, you know, maybe there's, there's nobody that knows about this game. And so cool. we try and find stuff that people will really enjoy over the, the course of the season. That way, when they're practicing it, when they're playing it, they're having a good time, they're enjoying it with each other, you know, and, and so we create this kind of community within our discord and all of our socials where people feel comfortable kind of going to each other, whether for advice on how to learn new skills or uh, whether just to play and have a good time as a, as a community. 
as these as these guys work together and through some very difficult situations, like you know, some of these games are crazy hard. Uh, have you seen that community develop in a way where they become friends beyond video games and become a support system beyond that? Absolutely. Like I, I honestly, you, you get to see so many different gamers that would have never communicated otherwise. You have you have two K players, like NBA two K players, hanging out with League of Legends players, and you know, vice versa. And it's and it's like. Those types of things happen because they realize there's there's a lot more that um, brings them together than what tears them apart, right? And yeah. and they also learn. I, I always talked about it like you know it's one thing to accept somebody's differences; it's another thing to truly appreciate their differences and like to tr- appreciate why you need their differences. And so like when you're having to compete in a strategy game and you, you don't know anything about strategy games because you play sports you know, your teammate becomes so valuable to you that you treasure them, right? And you treat them right and you respect them. And, and so that, that creates that community of, of, of respect where, you know, you need that person. You can't really, you know, talk down to them because even though they're different than you, you need them in order to make sure that you're um, coming out on top. And so it's been a, it's been a cool thing to see uh, within our community. One thing I like about that too, we're talking about how you have games across different genres there are things in other games that might reflect as like, oh, that valuable skill you got from, say, a Madden game is real useful when you're playing an RPG game. And if they weren't communicating with each other, they would never discover that. So that's so exactly, cool. exactly, exactly. And then and the, the thing is, like, every game is so similar, which is different graphics, right? Yeah. There's only so many buttons on a controller, right? So there, there's only so many keys on a mouse so or on a keyboard. So it's like they're all the same. They just have different graphics and different mm-hmm. skills that are used. And so you have to like learn the rules to the game and then you can kind of play them and, and, and make it uh, exciting and fun and, you know, that type of stuff. And so when the gamers start learning that and picking that up, they really start to, to, to thrive in that gaming world. Yeah. And you guys have 33 games you offer. Is there uh what is the selection process for that? What are you looking for? Uh, a couple things. So um, a lot of times we're looking for a lot of fun. Like, I, and for me, especially like if the game is really, really fun, then I'll implement it in and find a competitive way to play that game. Um, but um, otherwise, it's like we don't really care for graphics like that. That's cool. It can can or cannot have graphics like that. That's not important. It's it comes down to like fun playability. You know, is there a lot of glitches and, and are those glitches fixable? Oh, yeah. um, those types of things. Otherwise, like we'll kind of play anything and we've played card games all the way down to you know, like sports and, and uh, simulating races and non-simulating races. And so um, we'll, we'll kind of do it all. It, it, you know, it's just, is it fun? Is there a game that your players have, have demanded, we'll say, uh, and then you brought into the system? Um, there's been a couple games they said absolutely will never work. That was like League of Legends was one of them. And that ended up working. Um, Yu-Gi-Oh was another uh, games that they had demanded. Oh, this season it was like Blaze Blue Central Fic- Fiction. Has it's really since season one, everybody's been requesting that game. So we finally put it in this season. Um, there was another one that was that was requested heavily, and I cannot remember. Um, can't remember what it was, but I, I've had. I'll blame you for the thirty-three games. Yeah, I'm yeah, surprised yeah, you remember yeah, what that, you do have. Yeah, yeah. We change. So we. I mean, we change the games every six months too. So, um, so it's like you're doing sixty-six different games a year. Um, and yeah, so it's keeping up with them, but there's so many games this season that we're so excited about die by the blade, um, is one of them. Midnight ghost hunt is, um, oh my God, it's, it's so fun. That game is just amazingly fun. Jack did is another one. Um, you know, um, final stand Ragnarok is another one. It's kind of like MMORPG, uh, mm-hmm. style, um, you know, checkmate showdown. Yeah. There's just so many that are just like really good. Um, um, so so obviously esports has been growing over the years and and I think sp- especially since the pandemic it's really found a new life. Um we're starting to see we're going to be in 2025 it's coming to Saudi Arabia for its first like real big Olympic event. Uh what kind of benefits do you see that belongs in esports that will uh translate to the mainstream audience once they start watching it in the Olympics? Um I think most of it still won't translate. I think right. that um Esports has historically always focused so heavily on the game and there isn't any sport that's been successful in doing that. Like period. Like if you could think, if you could tell me a sport that's successful in doing that, I would bow, but not a single one. They always have a face or a player that makes the sport. Right. Um, there's always some superstar or some like 
somebody that just kind of goes outside of the game. You know, you had Larry Bird and Magic Johnson that kind of changed that that landscape. There was there was others that tried before it, but the focus once the focus shifted from from the game to people, that was when it really took over. And unfortunately, I think the way the Olympics and, and other esports are, are still run, there isn't enough focus on the people. They focus so heavily on the game and you're spending, you know, hours playing, um, playing a single game, which then ends up where you, you kind of get lost in translation. You're just watching graphics, right? Like you're just yeah. watching a digital, a digital landscape that you just can't care about. I, I don't know how you could care about it. So that's, that's my, my two cents. But, um, but no, I think, I think it'll be good to, to open up eyes to people that didn't know esports existed, mm-hmm. but otherwise I just, I don't know that it'll do a whole lot for it. It's really hard because when you watch it in person, it's a whole different experience. And I can't Rebecca, I, I go down to the overwatch world cup and uh, uh, down in LA and it's such a vibrant experience. I'm rooting for, for countries that I don't even normally care about, but when you're in it, you're like, Oh my God, it's so freaking electric in this room. So, but break it down though. Why is that? Right? Like, like, like if you break it down to its core, it's the people that that's the only reason if you took all the people out and it was just you in that room, yeah. Right. Is it any different now? Right. Like, yeah. like it's the people, the people are every experience. That's everything in the world is based on people. Right. Yeah. And so when you take the people out of it and you make it about a game that nobody cares about, and then you try to get people to care about that game, it's just not going to work. Like people right. aren't going to care. So yeah. you have to create an environment where the people matter both on- online and in person, right. Where the people are the, the, the center of the show, both mm-hmm. online and in person. And I think that's something that we do really well. Yeah. Well, yeah. Speaking to someone who has to manage so many players, how do you teach your players that, that they have to be the one that carries the industry forward and then they have to become almost a personality. You know, that magic Johnson, we're all waiting for that magic Johnson yeah. in sports. How does yeah. that happen? We do it for them. Like we oh, cool. do it for them. They all have that personality. They all have that ability to, to, to really shine, but we put that spotlight on them. We create the storylines around them. We create a superstar experience to where we can, we can make them feel like, look like, and then hopefully act like superstars. And whether they do or don't, we still make sure that we we treat them that way because right. we believe that they are and they eventually will be. We just got to put that spotlight on them. So as a, as a league, do you guys actually have to invest in PR management or things like that? Yeah. Yeah. We have a wellness manager that does not necessarily PR, but definitely like kind of keeping their head on straight, making sure yeah. for, you know, checking you know a lot of uh, a lot struggle with like anxiety and oh of course depression that type of stuff and so trying to trying to keep that in check um we do have um a a clinic that we work with um that does like uh you know acupuncture and um massage therapy and and other wellness practices um and so we do our best um to to kind of stay on top of those things and uh, and then we do our best to kind of help them manage their their uh pr stuff we do training around it um but you know, at the end of the day, it still kind of is the wild, wild west right now. It is. Yeah. But you're, you're paving the way to like, this is what a standardized version is going to look like. And that's what we need exactly. for the mainstream audience to start kind of grasping onto it is, is seeing these personalities and stuff. Exactly. Um, again, also with, with uh, uh, being embraced by the mainstream audience, you need to have some sort of standardized game. Do you think we're going to eventually get to that point where we're like, everybody agrees that Gran Turismo is the racing game to choose? No, no. Never. So how do you do that? How do you, There's, how do you find a game that's going to work? You have to think about it like this. Like, at what point are we going to decide which movie runs the movie industry, right? Like, at what point are we going to decide which song is the song that everybody has to listen to? It's art. Like, it's never going to happen. It's 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 right. literally art. It's created. People enjoy it. And then they get rid of it, right? Mm-hmm. Like, that's just how it works. You'll always have the nostalgia, and that's cool. Um, but it's art. So you have to yeah. treat it like that, right? There is something about basketball that is also art, but the sport and the organization of basketball is what kind of creates this, this sport, if you will, right? Mm-hmm. You have to take it outside of, um, of the game and make a sport around gaming. Gaming's yeah. not going anywhere. Gaming yeah. will stay here forever, whenever, right? right? And so if the sport's around gaming, then as the games evolve, you can insert game, replace game with another game and just continue that forever. Right. The sport yeah. is gaming. It's not a game and it never will be. Yeah. And so um, everyone trying to decide what the most popular game will only work while it's popular and then yeah. it will die. Just like, you know, you, you're seeing the biggest game in history, Fortnite slowly start to die off. Right. Okay. And it has been for a long time. And so 
you know, and there, there's billions of dollars being put into it and tons of creators being put into it and they're creating this metaverse and that's all great, but it still gets boring. Right. And, and it doesn't matter what you do. It's still going to get boring. You have to slowly start to reinvent and reinvent. And so, yeah, will that ever happen? I don't believe so. I'm not in that yeah. camp. I think that at the end of the day, we have to create a sport around gaming and gamers and that's yeah. it. It will never be about a game. Well, that, that goes back to what you're saying. And it's such a great point. What you're saying is it has to be the person. And so I want to see, you know, Steve take on Minecraft. I want to see Steve take on any game and yep. that's what it's focused on. And that's good. That's a really good point that I never thought about before. And, uh, and the fact that you guys have, again, that 33 game stable that people could choose from it's, it's again, you're following the person, not necessarily the game. That's amazing. Yeah. And it shifts. So every season we do new games. So it's a new 33 every season and you never know what's coming. We don't tell you until the day of, we just had the release last week and you're playing all 33 games in a single match. So each game is only taking like five to 10 minutes, if that. So you're literally going through from game to game, to game, to game, to game. And at the end, whoever has the most points wins. So it's, it's really about the person and how good they are at adapting and how good they are at shifting and what skills they have. It is not about the game and it never will be. Hmm. So last season, season eight, you guys had that hundred thousand dollar cash prize. Hmm. How has that uh, elevated the competitive nature of your players? Man. Uh, so jumping, we jumped from 40,000 to a hundred thousand that changed a lot. Um, it brought yeah. in a lot of new competition and a lot of new competitors. Um, it's a, it's a lot more people taking it seriously. Uh, knowing that it had potential, right? I think that was a big shift for us is is when people started to see the potential. And so um, it made it a little easier when we went from, we had a $200,000 tournaments and then now um, we're at a million dollars. So when we jumped to a million dollars, that, that again, new competition, oh, you know, yeah. a lot more eyeballs, a lot more people trying to, to, to kind of get that thrown. And so, um, so yeah, it just elevates everything. It elevates the player most importantly. And, and that's really what we're going for. That's a, uh, yeah. And that's one thing too, people don't understand is that, these players, they have to practice constantly. It's just such a big part of their life. And that prize at the end is, it's not just like a nice bonus. They be, it becomes their job. That's why sponsors yeah. and again, being your own person is really important and like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's amazing. Now we do do things a little different to be clear though, because that mm -hmm. our million dollars, that's a, like a salary cap for the team. So essentially yeah. we pay it out win or lose to the players. So the players oh, are, are literally salaried. They, they make up to a hundred thousand dollars a year, anywhere from 20,000 to a hundred thousand dollars a year yeah. playing video games. So it's, it's, you know, it is very different. They are professionals and they get paid as professionals. They're not only professionals are not only paid if they win they're professionals. Yeah. So they get paid period. Right. So right. we're not in a tournament mode. We're an actual league, right? Like we're not doing tournaments. We're doing an actual league. You get paid win or lose. You make it to the playoffs. You get bonuses. You win the championship, you get a bonus, but you get paid no matter what. And uh, going right back to that mainstream thing, that's how you make it more and more legitimate every day. That is yeah. a really smart move that actually should be echoed by everybody. That's a really yeah. good move. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, going uh, to again, back to how you started out as a gaming lounge and now you're uh, Nova's number one black owned esports league. How are you trying to promote inclusion in all that? Because it's such a cool thing to be able to, to share with the world and stuff like that. How are you spreading that? Yeah, we, we're the number one league in the U.S. now, to be clear. But um, so we should probably get that updated. But um, how are, we're, look, we, we don't even have to to try to promote inclusion yeah. because we include so many different games. We get so many different types of people at yeah. the end of the day, like gamers are all of us. It's two out of three households in the U S we're all gamers. Right. And so trying to include the games is, is what keeps us inclusive. It's what keeps us like, you know, cool. What's it's what keeps us relevant. It's, it's finding games that people will enjoy. Um, and then that creates this, like you, you find this niche game that has a small community that's kind of been ostracized and never would have thought <laughs> they would have had an esport in it. And they got, you know, 10,000 fans or whatever, you know, and now those 10,000 fans have a place to go and that becomes yeah. something special. Right. And we do that over and over and over every season, bringing in new communities and, um, and hopefully creating, you know, giving them another community that they can latch onto and, and become a part of. On the other side of that business too, you have video game developers, like I'm thinking of Among Us, who out of nowhere, it was out for a couple of years or whatever, and then blew up. Yep. Um, yep. You have video game companies that are like, hey, can you check out our game or whatever? And it's yep. a, a good situation where everybody goes. That is 95% of our business model. So our revenue, 95% of it comes from the developers. There you go. They pay to, to join the league. Yeah. And then that money goes to actually funding the players play. so that they're, that's a wonderful business. The players are literally paid to play the games. They so pay cool. us, we pay the players. I'm about to find a game that I'm good at here in a second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you join right. our Discord, we just released the list for uh, season nine. So, and there's there some good go. games. 
Uh, I gotta see. Oh man, <laughs> our over on the UEL, you guys have grown to 400 uh, player uh, members. What's what's the next level of expansion you're trying to achieve? Sure. Yeah. So so we actually have so um, I, we have 206 uh, players under contract. Um, we have uh, 2,000 gamers within our like ecosystem. Wow. 200,000 on our email email list. Um, our next goal, uh, I mean, just take over gaming. So we're we're right. currently in a fundraise, should close it in September. Um, with that fundraise, we're going to put a lot of money into marketing. We actually haven't spent uh, but 20000 in five years in marketing. So mm-hmm. everything we've done has been grassroots. Um, so now we want to really push and, and start promoting and advertising and kind of just explode onto the scene, which yeah. is why I'm doing a lot of these. You're going to see course. a lot of podcasts like this because yeah. this is now my job is just, you know, kind of putting putting UEL on the map. And, and, mm-hmm. uh, and so that's what I'm, I'm planning to do. That's amazing. And with, with the expansion going worldwide, um, how are you incorporating like remote gaming and stuff like that? Are you seeking eventually to do, uh, in-person events, anything like that? It's all in person. So we actually don't right, do yeah. anything online now, but, but yeah, so we are looking, so we, um, we just started a new hub in New York that was announced uh, last week. We did another one in Atlanta, um, uh, in, in Georgia. And then we actually have Right now, we're in talks with probably about 15 other um, states and hubs. Yes. And so um, those will probably all close, if I'm honest. Uh, and so uh, those will probably all close before the season starts, actually. And so what that does is it allows people to join the league, even if they don't live in this area, and then they yeah. can compete out of a hub. So they do they can't do it from their house, but they can go to a hub and compete at that location within the league. So you can get drafted, even if you live you know, in, in Vegas or California, you still can get drafted, go to a hub and then compete in the league. That that's cool because there's so much of an experience when you're actually seeing, uh, esports done live again, like I was talking about before with, as an audience member, but also as a player, um, Mm -hmm. that, that you want to be able to capture that for everybody that's involved. That's really cool. Exactly. You open world up in San Francisco. I'm going to at least go by and visit and check it out while everybody else is competing. So (laughs) heck yeah. Okay. (laughs) Got you. (laughs) Um, yeah. So again, it's, it's on the rise and, uh, you're really creating a legacy here. Um, where could people follow you guys? Like, where are they watching? Can they watch these live streams? How could they participate in your community? I know obviously discord for sure. Yeah, yeah for sure. So we're streaming on uh, eight, eight different platforms right now. Mm-hmm. Um, wait, we, uh, we're looking at, um, so you, you follow us on every platform at UEL esports. So you just type in UEL esports and any social media, any streaming platform. And we're there under that. You can also go to UEL esports.com and that has all our info in it too. Okay. All those links are going to be in the description guys. Um, and then your next event, when's, uh, or what your next season, when's the next season starting? Starting, uh, August 28th. Um, so we'll be starting that thing up. I think it, it's actually the 29th. That's the Thursday. Uh, okay. so that season starts and, uh, it's going to be a good game. Every game this season is going to be electric because every, every team is so well balanced. Um, every game is just going to be close, probably going into overtimes a lot of time. Um, and we're, we're excited because it's, it's going to be fun. It's, it's, it's super, it's, it's super interesting to watch. You, you got to tune in. That, oh, I definitely am. That's incredible. Again, all the links to that in the uh, description guys. So, um, we're going to make sure to share and remind you guys when it actually happens. Hey, starting today, UEL tune in. Um, that is going to be a blast. Titus, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been fantastic talking to you. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me, man. I really <laughs> appreciate it. All right, guys, again, follow the links in the description and we'll see you guys next week. Bye.